old. Um, just pumped to be here. Just want to, before we jump in, I want to honor Pastor Jared and uh, your church. Can we just give it up for your pastor really quick? How many of you have heard of the send? Has anyone heard about the send? Okay, that's encouraging. That actually encourages me a little bit. Um, I want to share a little bit, you know, the, the, the Send has been on this journey in 2023, 2024. Um, this will be our fourth arena that we've done. Um, and, uh, you know, the Send started really believing that Gen Z is, is the catalyst to finishing the Great Commission. Um, currently 3.2 billion people that don't know the name of Jesus and have no access to the gospel. And the Send really started of like this belief of, what if we could gather around the Great Commission? What if we could gather the church, get before God, and get commissioned by His Spirit? And so we're coming to, to Nashville. This is kind of the, the end of a, of a season for us. We've been in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We've been in Reading, Pennsylvania. And we've been in Boston, Massachusetts, gathering the church. And it's all culminating here in Nashville, Tennessee, the, the music city. Um, and, and believing that there is a sound that is about to come out of Nashville of here am I, send me. And so we're gathering February 3rd, Bridgestone Arena, with 16,000 believers crying out to God, believing that this generation, that our nation, that this city is meant to be a sending city. And so uh, we've, we've kind of broken it down. I'll give you a little bit of, of where we're going for the send. We've kind of broken down missions into five categories. We did this pretty much to give no excuse that everyone, once you hear it, it's like, well, I can't really say I'm not a missionary because we kind of try to just fit life into uh, five mission fields. So, you know, we're believing, could we call uh, to reach every high school and every university campus? Vulnerable children looking at the foster care and adoption world and saying, what, what's the church's answer to this problem? What's, a, you know, really believing that the church is the solution. Um, looking at your neighborhood. Everyone has a, has a neighborhood, right? Missionary. Okay. Could we reach our neighborhoods with the simple gospel? And then looking out 3.2 billion people that don't know the name of Jesus. What is our response to the, the global crisis of people not having access to scripture? And so we're, we're coming together on February 3rd. Tickets are $22, okay? That's nothing, okay? 22 bucks plus some ticket master fees. Can't do anything about that. Wish we could. Uh, but $22, the arena is filling up. Um, join us, it's an all day event. So, you know, come for what you can. But uh, I've, I've, you know, been to our, our gatherings. It's... You, the Holy Spirit is just through the whole thing. We've got amazing bands, amazing worship leaders, amazing speakers that are gonna join us. So you can scan this QR code, um, that'll take you, or if you don't wanna scan the QR code, you don't have a smartphone, you can go to the send.org um, and uh, you, can, you can get your tickets there, but we're gathering February 3rd. What day? Who's gonna try to be there with us? Just show of hands. Okay, I'll be looking for you. I'll be looking for you. And we've got a booth um, that'll be out in the foyer. If you've got more questions, I'll be out there. Two of our, our guys from our team will be out there. Uh, we've got some flyers. Take some flyers. Um, tell somebody about the send and, and, and we'd love, to, uh, we'd love to, to see you there. But put up that photo of my family. This is my family. That's my beautiful wife, Rachel. She's, uh, she's home today with our two kids. We've got uh, my son who just turned four yesterday, um, Reese Graham. And then that's my daughter. She's, uh, she's two and uh, that's Nova Flory. And uh, we, we just moved to Nashville three months ago. And um, I just gotta be honest, like the worship teams here in Nashville are different. <laughs> like... I grew up in the Northwest and they'll take anybody for a worship team. They're just glad that someone came to church on Sunday, you know, and uh, cause everyone's leaving Washington and, and, uh, but I have just been blown away. I just want to give a shout out to the worship team. You guys, uh, both services, absolutely insane. Um, I got to go to the Ryman the other night, um, the Ryman auditorium and uh, heard a bunch of, I'm not like a big, like you, my team jokes about it all the time. I'm not really like a live music guy, um, but I was presently, like I was surprised, you know? It was fun, you know? I think I, could, I think I could get used to that, but I'm not gonna be like the Broadway guy, you know? Like my, my just a little bit about me. I, I can't stand going to a restaurant and they have live music. 
Anybody with me? No? You live in Nashville. Of course not. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, no, I, like, I love the music. I'm like, I don't go to a restaurant to like have a slice of pizza and then listen to like, a, like someone while I'm trying to have a conversation with someone, you know? I'm like, I go to the restaurant and I'm like, hey, can you sit me as far away as you can? I, I prefer not to hear the music. And they look at me just so surprised and shocked. And yeah, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm that guy. Welcome to, welcome to Nashville. Um, <laughs> But uh, like Pastor Jared said, I've, I've been serving in YWAM for the last 10 years. Um, it's where I met my wife. They, another acronym they use for YWAM is uh, Young Women After Men. Um, <laughs> it worked for my wife. Um, so if you're a young person still looking, YWAM could be your place. Um, we're definitely outnumbered um, by women. So uh, if you're a dude and you're single, and uh, it's, it's, it's better than online dating, just going to be honest. <laughs> Um, so that's my pitch for YWAM, I guess. Um, and, and ladies, you know, you too. Um, anyways, uh, I met my wife in YWAM. Uh, we had two kids. I went for a six month season to do a DTS discipleship training school. And 10 years later, a wife and two kids, I'm still here. Um, and, uh, it has been the greatest privilege of my life is to, uh, serve Jesus in this way of being on the mission field, traveled all over the world, bring the gospel to the unreached. And um, we, uh, we're here in Nashville. We've got a team of 24 missionaries that just moved here last week um, to pioneer a community called Fire and Fragrance, which is a ministry of YWAM. Has anyone done YWAM here? Let's go. Let's go. Okay, family. Um, we're like the Marines, you know, once a YWAMer, always a YWAMer. Um, so, uh, so you did Fire and Fragrance too? Let's, are you? Oh my gosh, we got to talk. That's so cool. Um, you were there early days, so we probably said some wild stuff back then. So we've, you know, like the early days of pioneering, you just do some wild things. And, and you were there 2011? 12. Yeah, I apologize for, um, I heard, I've heard stories. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so we're, we're here pioneering a, a ministry, believing that, that as we look at Gen Z, and I'm going to share some mission statistics. As we look at our Gen Z, we see one of the most missional generations in history. And I believe we're poised for a Jesus movement. You look out and you, you, you look at the Jesus movement of the 70s and you look at some of the things that we're you know, experiencing today. There's a lot of similarities. And looking out in some of the stats, Barna came out with some research, you know, saying about Gen Z that 52% of young Christians see themselves as potential missionaries. Uh, George Otis Jr., another statistician, he came out with a study that said 70% of young people, this was more of a secular statistic, 70% of young people feel morally obligated to change the world. But only 4% of Gen Z is a biblical worldview. So you've got a generation that, that wants to change the world, but only 4% of them actually have the blueprints on how to do it. And so we've, we've come here to Nashville not believing that we're the answer, we're the solution, believe that God is doing something in this region and we want to partner with it. So 24 missionaries moved, left Hawaii um, to come to Nashville, Tennessee, um, <laughs> believing that God is about to do something in your region. And I'm just going to be honest with you guys, this, this, you're also not going to like me because of this. I, I am so glad to be off that rock in the middle of an ocean. You can only drive in circles so many times um, before you get anxiety. Um, and you're just like, if something were to happen, I have nowhere to go, you know? And that, that definitely like, you know, a little bit of fear every once in a while. So I'm, I'm so stoked um, to be in, in Nashville. Can I give us some mission statistics before we jump into the message? Is that Okay. I just want to give you kind of a, a present picture of where we are in global missions right now. So there's set currently 7,407 unreached people groups, which equals about 3.2 billion people. So what I mean by this is that there's 3.2 billion people that have no access to scripture. And the thing about living in, in America is we are so blessed we're so rich. We're so wealthy. Even this morning, uh, a couple of my, my, my friends that are, came up here with me, um, I was getting made fun of because I have an ESV Bible. And any other ESV people in the house, let's go. Um, you know, they're, they're making fun of me and they're telling me which translation they like. And, you know, I, I, I wake up this morning and I'm studying the Bible and I've got uh, an app on my, on my uh, iPad that gives me over a thousand Bible resources at the snap of my finger. 
I've got every translation you could imagine. I've got, you know, the Septuagint, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. I mean, I've got it all, every commentary you could possibly think of. But the reality of an individual this morning is that there is someone, there's 3.2 billion people that have no access to scripture, no access to the gospel, no access to a thriving church community like New Tribe. And it, and it grieves me, and, and here's another stat, is less than 1% of all missionaries in the world are working among these 3.2 billion people. What does this mean? There are t- less than 12,000 missionaries trying to reach 3.2 billion people. Currently, there's one Christian missionary in the Muslim world working amongst 405,000 people. One person is responsible to reach 405,000 people. That is an injustice. And I believe that rooms like this are the solution. And I believe you didn't come to church just so that you could fulfill your religious duty. You came to church because you encountered the gospel. You met Jesus. You found a community. And if you really do believe the Bible, the final words of Jesus was this great commission. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go. The answer for where we're at in our nation is the spirit-empowered believer. It's you. Like there's not, we don't live in a day where it's the man of God, you know, power for the hour. We're just looking at the the, the Billy Grahams of our day. No, we live in a new day where the spirit of, uh, excuse me, where the spirit of Billy Graham is on every believer. Jesus said this, he says, it's better that I go because if I don't go, you don't get the helper. If he doesn't go, the Holy Spirit doesn't infect the church. And now we get to walk around as gospel witnesses everywhere you go. So that we create church in the workplace. We create church at our high school, at our university campus. We create church in our homes. We create church everywhere we go because the Spirit of God is in you. I want to dive into uh, the word today. Can we... uh, Look at Isaiah 6. Open uh, your Bible. I'm going to read out of the ESV. If you didn't bring your Bible, we're going to have the big Bible up. And I'm just going to read this. In the year that King Uzziah died, we're going to go verse 1 through verse 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood, stood the seraphim. Each had wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am a, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin has been atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. I'm gonna preach a classic missions message. Is that okay? But I believe that there's, there's something on, I felt like we really experienced something in the first service. I, I'm, I'm not here to just, to, to necessarily be a, a great teacher. I am here to provoke you. I believe that's why God sent us here. I believe that's why I'm here this morning is to provoke you into action is that you would leave service this morning feeling like you have a part to play in the Great Commission. 
because you do. And I look at this story, right? We, we, we look at the beginning. We have, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. So we got to understand cultural context here. King Uzziah, right? He was a national leader. Think about, you know, if we were to put this in our context, in our day, thinking about a national leader had just died. Think, think JFK moment, right? What is going to happen? Where are we going as a nation? Where are we going as a society? Thinking about, you know, what, what's going to happen to my taxes? What's going to happen to the schools? Who's going to be put in leadership? All the fear that can come up with a little bit of uncertainty. Honestly, if we really, if we really do look at where we're at, we're probably experiencing that. What's going to happen in 2024? We know we have an election coming up. What's going to happen? Who's going to get elected? And we have this moment where Isaiah is not looked at the present circumstance. He finds himself far above the present circumstance. And it says that he sees the Lord high and lifted up. What would happen if the church would not look at our present circumstance, but instead see the Lord high and lifted up? Because that's where the solution is. The solution isn't in a political figure. The solution isn't, you know, well, my kids go to this school, my kids go to that school. Of course, we need to think about some of these things. But the solution is found in the person of Jesus. And Isaiah doesn't see himself concerned with who's going to get elected. He goes to the solution. He goes to Jesus. And it says that he sees the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe fills the temple. And we have this beautiful moment where, you know, Isaiah has this incredible experience with God where he, 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 he meets the atoning presence of, of Jesus where this, these tongs come down, touch his lips, make him holy. And then the only appropriate response that Isaiah has where he hears the counsel of heaven, who's going to go for us? The only appropriate response of someone who has been with Jesus, I'll go. It's the volunteer. I've, I, 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 don't, I don't have the answer. I, 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 I may not have it all within me. I may not have the, the ability or the skills, but I have been with Jesus. My eyes have seen the King and the only appropriate response is here I am. Send me. It's 2024. How, is there anyone who's gotten into cold plunging? No one? We're not into that yet? Can I get one? Is there anyone who's done a cold plunge? Okay, okay, there's a few, there's a few people, right? Okay, so it seems like 2024 is the year of the cold plunge. I, I don't know, we're like, there's, there's like, it's going viral on Instagram, viral on TikTok. And I, I started following this like 13 year old kid on Instagram. And he posted, he posted a video on like, I don't know what it was, he's 20 days. I just watched his video between services. He's on day 20. And, uh, and he posted one video. He's like a 13, 14 year old kid. Kind of, you know, he's a little heavier set kid. And his first video he posted, he says, I'm gonna do an ice bath every day until next Christmas. And, and his first ice bath was like this little tub. Like, I, I don't even, like a, like a moving box. Like it was, it was not like a tub. And he's a bigger kid, you know? And so you, you just see his first video, he dumps a bunch of ice in this water and then he just kind of plops down in this little bin. And, and you're like, oh, it goes viral. Like, like stupid viral. Like millions and millions of views. And all of these um, ice bath companies start sending these kids like thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment to upgrade his ice bath game. And now he's like, like every day he makes a video, he's like lying in like a new ice bath. And I'm sitting here in like my, you know, I, I, I've got a cheap little tub and this kid's in like a $2,000 tub just chilling. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. But I saw his video and it was kind of like what tipped it over for me. I'm like, this kid can do it, I can do it. And so I went on Amazon, I got, I had an Amazon gift card from Christmas. And so I, uh, I went and I bought myself a, an ice bath. And I remember the first day, guys, I, I don't like cold things. I lived in Hawaii, right? Like the ocean was always like a balmy 70 degrees. It was 85 degrees outside. Like this week, I, I don't even know how to cold proof my house. <laughs> People are telling me that I need to do stuff. And I'm like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've lived on an island, you know, where it's 80 degrees 
any time of the year. And so, you know, I'm learning all this stuff. So I've, I've got my ice bath out there. This is a couple weeks, uh, a week ago. So Sunday last week was my first ice bath. And, and I, I remember I'm sitting out there and I'm like, okay, I got this. I got this. And I'm looking at the bath and it's, it was pegging at like 38 degrees, the water temp. That's cold. Okay. That's <laughs> That's cold. And so I'm, I, I, I end up getting in and I'm, I get up to like right here and I'm like, oh, it's, that's a little cold. I step back out and my wife is watching me. My kids are watching me. I'm like, oh, I'm embarrassing myself as a dad right now and a husband. And I'm just like staring at the ice bath. And I finally, I'm just like, I'm gonna do it. And I climb in this ice bath and I make it a minute. 60 seconds was all I had in me. I, 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 and, I was, and I get out. And uh, I've got roommates that, that live in our, our basement. Some of our YWAM staff that have moved here, they're living in our basement. And uh, they were talking about how crazy it was after my first ice bath. I got out of that thing and I was just like that. I was like, whoa! I mean, I was in my house, I was running, it was a Sunday. I just, you know, we got home from church and, you know, I do the ice bath thing and then I'm like, okay, babe, let's go do a workout. We had just gotten a, a new barbell and some plates. So we're downstairs doing a, a little workout and I'm just like, I've got so much energy. I feel like I could have ran through a wall. Like nothing could have stopped me. And so now I've, I've been doing an ice bath every single day. I'm not posting about it, you know, I should, maybe I could get some free gear, but I, I'm doing it every day. And, and yesterday for my son's birthday, he just turned four, he was born at 4.44 in the morning. So I did four minutes and 44 seconds at 35 degrees in the ice bath. I was pretty proud of it. And I had done some of the, I had done some of the research, you know, Andrew Huberman, I listened to the Joe Rogan podcast and I got convinced and, and all this stuff. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, so I've been in sales my whole life. You know, now I'm just, you know, I was a dope dealer. Now I'm a hope dealer. Like we're just continuing on with, with the, with being a, being a salesman. And, um, you know, but as soon as I did that ice bath every day with my staff team, I am telling them, like, you guys got to get in the ice bath. It's better than coffee. And I'm just, you know, every day I'm coming in. To, I'm coming in. We did a whole week with our team last week, and I'm teaching, and I'm just coming in there like, guys, ice bath. Who's done it today? I have. Did it for three minutes this morning. Where are you guys at? I, didn't, I haven't had any coffee today. I don't need coffee. I've got ice. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, I got ice in my veins. Like, what do I do, you know? And, and all of a sudden it starts to catch on. I've got one of my other friends, he's going to his gym and he hopped in their pool, out, outside pool that they have and he's doing it and I've got my wife doing it. And I've just, I've, I started getting all these people doing it. Why? Because I had experienced something. I had experienced the benefits, the mental clarity, the energy, the adrenaline. And I'm like, the recovery from a workout. I'm like, you've got to try the ice bath. And people believe me. How many of you are going to, as I'm talking, you may, uh, maybe I'm going to try an ice bath. Anybody? Okay, let's go. A few people. I'm convincing a few people. See, this is good. So when I was, uh, I, I graduated high school and I, I've been in, I worked retail jobs. One of the retail jobs I had is I worked and sold women's shoes at Nordstrom. And, uh, you know, it's a little different when a lady comes in and she's like, so tell me, are these heels comfortable? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she's looking at me like, and do you know this how? And I'm like, just trust me, lady. <laughs> you know, like I work on commission. Honestly, I need to sell. Um, I got to pay rent. Uh, gas went up again. So can you just buy the, buy the shoe? I, they're comfortable, okay? <laughs> you know, but there, there's, there's, something, there's something different. I'm like, no, someone told me they're comfortable. Like, I, I'm pretty sure they're, they're, they're yeah, like this is going to be a good shoe for you to buy. Right, and it's, and it's interesting, like, you know, on, on, on one side of, you know, Mr. Polar Plunge, is I've experienced it for myself. You're not going to be able to shut me up about it. To working at Nordstrom, trying to sell women's shoes, all I really became is I just, I, I, this is so bad. I basically just started flirting with older women <laughs> to just convince them that they should buy the shoe. Like, you know, you look so beautiful today. Buy the shoe. Buy the shoe. I, I, I wasn't married yet, okay? I wasn't in YWAM yet, okay? Cut me some slack. But that's really why I was a little flirt to convert, okay? I'm, I, I'm guilty. But it was just kind of like, that's how I was doing it. But there's something different when someone experiences something and tells you about it versus someone that has no experience and tries to tell you about it. I wanna go in one more, one more scripture. We're bouncing around. It's all going to make sense, I promise. And I want us to go to John 1, verse 36. And it'll be up here on the screen again. 
And this is in this moment, you know, we have John the Baptist um, and, and he's, you know, preparing the way for Jesus and he's this incredible figure and he's locusts and wild honey. He probably had this crazy beard going on and he's experiencing a move of God as he's baptizing all these people. And he has this moment with his disciples, one of them, a guy, Andrew, and it says, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, verse 36, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Skip down to verse 40. And it says, one of the two who had heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And of course, we know how this story goes. You know, Peter becomes the rock. He has this revelation where Jesus is saying, who do the, who do the people say that I am? You know, some say you're this, some say you're that. And Peter has this moment. He says, you're Christ. You're, son of, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at him. He says, yes. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And he goes on and we find the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit falls on 120 in an upper room. And it's Peter who gets up and he preaches in front of this mass of people. And it says that 3000 came to the Lord that day. All because one man beheld Jesus. All because John the Baptist in this moment said, behold the Lamb of God. And you see, we can't do missions without beholding. We can't do missions without presence. The moment we do missions without presence is when it becomes humanitarian work. And we just become another good organization that seemingly is doing good things, but isn't actually meeting the need, the real need of the broken, the hurting, and the dying, which is the answer, the antidote, the cure for the cancer that is sin. You can feed people all day long and they can still go to hell. You can hand out clothes, you can do wells, you can build homes all day long. And the reality is, is someone is still going to hell. What would happen if the church beheld the lamb again? My favorite people to go and do evangelism with, well, I'll say this, my favorite people to not do evangelism with, a lot of the time is people that are like 20, 30 years saved. I've been, I've been on this road before, I've done this. It's kind of, you know, what we were hearing this morning about the callous. You know, your heart gets a little bit callous. And, it, and if I'm honest, and I was honest with my team this last week, man, I'm, I'm, I'm like kind of like getting stirred again of like, it's been a while since I've like shared the gospel. Just stop someone on the street, preach the gospel to them, pray for a sick person. I, I mean, it's really easy to do it in this building. This is safe, it's nice. But it's another thing when you're in the workplace, you're in the marketplace, and there's someone who's, you know, all sorts of wildness, and God begins to prompt you on something, and you're like, oh, I don't want to touch that. I'll stay on the prayer team at church. My favorite people to go and do evangelism with is someone we just led to the Lord. Because, like, these guys, like, well, you know, we... we preach the gospel to someone, they get saved. And we, we, you know, we do this all the time when we're doing evangelism. Is we'll pray, we'll, we'll lead them to the Lord, and we'll pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and we'll say, okay, let's go. Let's go preach the gospel now to someone else. Let's go find someone else. Um, and, then, and usually this is how it goes, especially if you're preaching to someone off the street. They go up and they go find somebody like, bro, you gotta effing hear what this man just told me. They're like cussing the guy out, trying to preach the gospel. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. But it's so pure. And the reality is, is that guy's gospel presentation with like 50 F-bombs is more powerful, more potent. Why? Because it's authentic. I'm not saying let's all go out on the street and just drop (laughs) F-bombs preaching the gospel. Well, the guy told me I could do this, so uh, here we are, you know. 
That's not the permission slip I'm trying to give you. It's more of this, it's fresh for them. And when it's fresh, it's potent. And I, if I'm honest, I'm just, I'm, I'm preaching to myself this morning. If I'm really honest and I take a real look in the mirror, my gospel proclamation has been tainted a little bit by comfortability. And it's become a little less potent. And if we're honest, maybe we've, we've forgotten what's really happened to us. We've really forgotten about the exchange that happened on the cross. You didn't earn a seat in this room. That did. I, I don't deserve to be up on the stage. I remember when I was 16 years old, I, uh, I gave my life to the Lord when I was 16. And uh, I went to high school with this guy. His name was Jonah. He's one of my best friends today. He was the best man at my wedding. And... Um, he was that Christian that like, kind of like your parents warned you about. Like, hey, they're, they're kind of weird. Um, you know, they're a little out there. He, we'd, we'd be at lunch and he'd be talking about prayer and fasting and praying for sick people. And it made me really uncomfortable. Just kind of like, that's strange. I didn't hear anything about that. I don't know. Where's that in the Bible? And he's like, it's right here. I'm like, I don't see it. Um, <laughs> And every day of my, my sophomore year, this guy would come up to me and he'd say, hey, I want you to know that I love you and God loves you. And let's just be honest, as like a high school dude, another dude coming up to you and being like, I love you. And you're just like, noted, stay away from that guy. <laughs> like, not about that life. And he would come up to me almost every day. Hey, I just want you to know I love you and God loves you. And this guy would, would I, I would constantly see him praying for people, sharing the gospel, all sorts of stuff. And it became the last day of sophomore year. And at this time, I'm failing out of school. I'm diagnosed with clinical depression. I'm on pills. I'm on all this stuff. I'm selling drugs. I'm doing drugs. My life is, is going way far off. And I start to hear voices inside of my head. And I had grown up in elementary school at this private school in my city. And the voices began to tell me, go back to that private school, go back to that private school, go back to that private school. And so I talked to my parents, make this decision, okay, junior year, I'm going to go back to this school. And so I, uh, it's the last day of sophomore year and I had to catch the city bus, like public transportation, because I was an out of, uh, of county transfer in, in, um, in my area. And so I'm waiting at the city bus. And Jonah comes up and he goes, let me guess, you love me. Jesus loves me. And he tells me, this is, and I just said, hey man, this is, you know, this is my last day at, at school. And I'm like, praise God, I don't have to see this guy again. And I said, uh, I'm, not, I'm not coming back next year. And he goes, no way, me too. <laughs> I said, that's cool. Um, I'm, I'm going to a private Christian school down the road. And he goes, no way, me too. And there was a couple in our area, so I'm like, you know, maybe, you know, and he, and he says, which one? And I tell him the name, and he goes, no way, me too. And what I didn't know at the time is the, is the principal of, the, of uh, our, our high school had actually brought him in on a full scholarship to bring a spirit of revival to our high school. And um, we just kind of became friends. I started hanging around him because I didn't know anybody else. And we'd go out, you know, to Walmart or Starbucks or something, and, and he would just start preaching the gospel to people. And I'm like, this is making me so uncomfortable right now. Like, I, all I want to go do is go play Xbox. And he's like, let's go preach the gospel. <laughs> and so it was uh, junior year. We had one atheist in our school. Yes, they exist in private schools. And um, we're, we had a small group with all of the junior guys. And we're talking about fantasy football. The boys are being boys. We're kind of just doing our thing. And the atheist guy, he walks in and he looks at me and he says, Jeff, you're the fakest thing I've ever seen in my life in front of all my friends. And the reality was he was right because, you know, while my friend was coming to bring revival, I saw a bunch of rich private school kids and I saw a business opportunity to keep selling drugs. I was like, I'll make a little bit more money. This will be great. You know, I can feed my habit. And this guy looks at me, but my friend was also the all-star Christian. So I like kind of tried to do a little bit of the Christian thing, but also like, you know, doing the drug thing. And he looks at me and he says, you're the fakest thing I've ever seen in my life. And he was right. And I feel the fear of the Lord come over me. 
And I hear God's voice say this, if you're gonna take on my name, you need to act like it. And I remember that night, 16 year old me going into my room and giving my life to Jesus. And I got possessed. I got possessed. I started devouring the word of God. I started like any, any conference, like I was at the conference. If the Holy Spirit was there, I was there. Every church meeting, every prayer house, I was at everything. And I remember, you know, now this has been the summer going into our senior year. My friend is like, hey, and I hadn't done a whole lot of like preaching the gospel type stuff. My friends were like real deal evangelists. And so he, he's like, well, let's go to this movie. We're gonna go see the movie Man of Steel. Anyone seen that movie? The Superman movie? Okay, well, I'll just give you the premise of the story. There's a, there's a, a dad outside of our universe who sends his son to go and save Earth. Sound familiar? It's like the gospel. And so we're buzzing. We're like snuck in a bunch of whole, uh, like a, a Red Bull and we're like, you know, so we're jacked up on Red Bull and the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, cause we we're still in that process of sanctification, right? So I, I, you know, I still was sneaking stuff into movie theaters. And um, my, my buddy looks over to me and he says, we got to preach the gospel. And I'm like, no, let's not do that. The movie ends, credits start rolling. And my friend gets up in front of the whole movie theater and he goes, hey, everybody. And I'm like, oh no. And he goes, hey, everyone, Jesus is your superhero. And I'm like, oh my gosh. That's like the worst line ever. I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, I'm going to die tonight. This is crazy. Well, all of a sudden, the spirit of God starts to break out of the movie theater. We start leading people to Jesus. Demons start manifesting. We start praying for the sick. Sick people are getting healed. And I'm just like, I'm just going with it. I'm like, we're already this deep. Might as well just keep going. I'm praying for people. I'm seeing people take their boots off. I'm seeing people take their casts off. People are getting healed. And it's crazy. Spills out all the way into the, into the front of the movie theater. We see a full move of God in this movie theater. And these guys, they, they, they come out and they're like all like beefy type dudes and a little scary. And I was like, a, uh, like 120 pounds soaking wet in high school. And so I'm like, what am I gonna do, <laughs> you know? And they're, they just start, they, one guy pulls a knife out on us and my friend Jonah just starts walking up to these guys, like no fear at all. Jesus loves you guys so much. And he just keeps walking and you take one more step, we're gonna cut you, like all this crazy stuff. And this guy comes out of the corner and he goes, hey, you leave them alone. What they're doing is God. And these guys like freak out and run away. Something happens when you get possessed. You don't care what people think about you. You don't care really some of the repercussions of your actions. When you're possessed, when you've seen something, when you've experienced something, you can't keep me quiet. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I was blind. No, no, you don't understand. I was lost. And if, and if we're honest, if we, if we take real input of our lives, sometimes we think we've earned this life. Paul says your works are like filthy rags. Jesus paid such a high price. And I feel my word for you this morning comes out of Revelation 2. I'm just gonna read this really quickly and then we're gonna, we're gonna respond. So I know maybe we've gone a little bit over. This is verse four. This is a, a letter to the church of Ephesus. And Ephesus was awesome. Honestly, like, really not a whole lot of bad things to talk about the church of Ephesus. You know, in, the, in this letter, it's like, I've seen your works. I've seen your good deeds. You hate what's evil. You're doing all the stuff. But Jesus, he says this, he says, I have one thing against you. And it's that you've abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the works you did at first. This is a warning. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The solution for Nashville is a burning church. 
The solution for 3.2 billion people that have never heard the gospel is a burning church. Because you can't stay in the pew when you're burning. This is all good and amazing and we need more churches in Nashville. We need, no, we need more places of worship. But the church just becomes humanitarian if it's not outward focused and it's not present centered. And I just wanna provoke you this morning with a fresh love for Jesus. And maybe you've, you've just kind of like been doing the thing, going in the motion, living life as it is. But remember why Jesus came. It was to seek and save that which was lost. We can get so caught up in the upkeep of ministry and the upkeep of life that we forget what it's all about. To be burning in the workplace. You don't need to be a missionary. You don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be a leader in this church. God has empowered you with this Holy Spirit. Burn for him everywhere. Burn for him at Publix, at Kroger. Burn for him at the bank. Burn for him at the workplace. Burn for him in your high school. Burn for him in your university campus. And I promise you from this place, we will change the world. If you would just burn. Why don't we stand? I felt prompted after the first service, we're gonna pray two prayers. The first prayer is if, if you want that burning flame rekindled inside of your heart, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm gonna pray for you. Okay, I want you just to put your hands out like you're receiving a gift. Holy Spirit, would you come in this room this morning? And I pray for a fresh burning inside of our hearts that when people would come around us, it would be like those that were found on the road to Emmaus. Did our hearts not burn within us when we were around that man? I pray those testimonies in the workplace, that when people get around you, would it be, did our hearts not burn within us when I was talking to them? Did my heart not burn within me when they were talking, when they were looking at me? Holy Spirit, I pray a fresh love for Jesus this morning. Ignite our hearts again for the gospel. We meet, we, may we see the cross with fresh eyes. In Jesus' name. Second thing, if you are under 30 years old, I want you to raise your hand. If you're under 30, I want you to raise your hand. Okay. I'm under 30 as well. And I just wanna, I just wanna prophesy something over you. You are the solution. If you're in high school, raise your hand. I was 16 years old when I got saved. And I saw an absolute move of God on my campus where that atheist that I was telling you about, I led him to the Lord a year later. Because the lie of the enemy is going to say, be quiet. The lie of the enemy is gonna be, you're gonna lose friends. Guys, I'm telling you, I've been on the greatest adventure of my life because I have burned for Jesus. I have, met, I have sat in rooms of kings and rulers of nations, helping, you know, we've, we've done a number of things in Southeast Asia with cabinet leaders. And why? It's because we've burned for Jesus, not because we're gifted, not because you've got the best speech, not because you look the coolest, but because I burned for Jesus. Young person, I just wanna say and give you permission as another young person, burn, burn, burn for Jesus. It's the greatest decision you could ever make for your life is burn for Jesus. I wanna pray for you. So if you're, if you're young, if you're under 30, I just want you again, just to put your hands out. Holy Spirit, I pray for every young person in this room and I pray that you would come right now, Holy Spirit. I pray that you would activate them in the supernatural. I pray that you'd fill them afresh with the Holy Spirit and fire that when they go to school on Monday, maybe unless it's a snow deal, God, that they would be possessed with love for people on their campus and that the fear of man would bow to the name of Jesus. Yes. Holy Spirit, would you come and mark every young person in this room and we prophesy and declare over Nashville another Jesus movement. In Jesus' name, amen.